I'm happy to be here and I'll, I'll tell you a little bit uh, the talk that I gave uh, at TEDx Jerusalem a month ago. Um, basically I play. I play with objects and luckily I'm paid to do that. <laughs> and I've been doing that for over 20 years in United States. I publish in many magazines and also in Israel. Uh, I started working in Haaretz newspaper in the 90s. This is the wife of Israeli Prime Minister, Sarah Netanyahu, who has specific ways of dealing with cleaning. <laughs> and um, Israeli President Shimon Peres. And I also play with my food. Um, this is a, a campaign I did for Strauss a couple of years ago. So I want to show you a quick clip from that campaign that shows a little bit the process of my work. I see trees are green, red roses too. I see them bloom for me and you. And I think to myself, So, um, so really my talk is about what did I learn from 20 years of playing with bananas. So this is, this is really what I'm going to tell you about. So the first thing that I learned is that playing is good. All artists play. And uh, even Picasso played. Picasso played with food. Picasso played with objects. This is uh, a sculpture that Picasso made that uh, uses a bicycle seat and a bicycle handlebar to create a bull, the head of a bull. And uh, now Picasso, who was a master draftsman, he did not use his amazing drawing skill to do that. He only used his ability to look at the world in a different way. A name is a direct path. Once we name something, we go straight to the point, and then we're done. We understand it, and usually we move on. But what if we refrain from naming and we stay in the experience that we're having and we try to feel it intuitively, we might then discover something new. What if we took that playful road, that um, the scenic road, we might discover something new. So a good way to practice this is to look for faces. The world is filled with faces. And when we are starting to see them, we forget for a second the, direct, the name of something, the definition of something, and we stay with it, and we play with it, and we enjoy the discovery. And the faces are everywhere. This is the bathroom in my house. This is the fan in my studio. So looking for faces is a playful activity. Now. I love playfulness because playfulness had a strong effect in my life and I connect every day to the child I was. I grew up in Uruguay and I always drew and as a kid in Uruguay, uh, this is the oldest caricature I have, this is uh, my fourth grade teacher in Uruguay and in Uruguay there are many cows, so I drew cows and I even drew steaks. As you, can, as you can see, because <laughs> we love to eat meat in Uruguay, in South America. And gauchos on horses. And when I was 11, we made Aliyah. I came to live in Israel. So the subject matter slightly changed. <laughs> but I wanted to make caricatures. And I kept looking at newspapers and wanted to make caricatures just like the ones that I saw in the newspapers. But life is a way of happening to you. And um, I was already in my 20s when I finally wanted to become a professional caricaturist. And I actually wasn't accepted to Bezalel, to Bezalel Art School here. So I had to go and study in New York. And I studied in the School of Visual Arts in New York. 
And truth is that it wasn't a coincidence that I wasn't accepted to Bezalel. Because actually I sucked. I wasn't very good. I didn't have a good technique. And, um, and I realized that when I arrived to New York. Because while I was making very kind of middle of the road cartoons um, of New York in the 80s, you see Ed Koch and Giuliani and Dinkins there, the real pros were making some amazing work. And there was a real technique gap that I experienced. I just didn't have the tools to make what I wanted to do, what I wanted to do. So um, that made me feel very depressed. This is, you know, me depressed and pessimistic in New York. Now, if you, um, and, and basically I did hit a wall. If you remember the diagram from before, I hit this wall. The direct path was not working for me anymore. So I could go with the Roche Bakir, I could hit the wall with my head, or I could try to find another path that worked for me. And this started me going into that playful road. And as we know, sometimes the real treasures exist in the playful road. And only when you find an obstacle, you realize that you might be able to find another path. Um, the creator of lateral thinking, who coined the phrase lateral thinking, Edward de Bono, he calls the opposite of this, he calls it being blocked by adequacy. When everything is adequate, it's not great, but it's just working, you don't have an incentive to go to the other side of the road, go around. Just as Moran was speaking, when you find a wall, you really find opportunities that you might have not seen before. So I did find, I did find treasures. The first treasure I found, I found this illustration of the Great Dictator movie, the Charlie Chaplin Great Dictator movie. And I loved how little technique, drawing technique, the artists use here. And I said, hmm, this is what I needed to see because it is not about technique, it is about finding your own voice and it's about communication. And the second treasure I found is I was drawing Saddam Hussein in, an, in the 90s, 1990, the first Gulf War, I suddenly found this box of matches <laughs> near my table. And I realized that I could use the matches as the mustache of Saddam Hussein. So um, this is really just by a coincidence, by a happy accident, I started to make pictures with objects. Then I realized that this was something that suited me. I created a collage. I told my teacher, yeah, that's a collage. And I said, well, have you ever seen what is the word collage? So I looked at the definition of collage. And collage is a creation that takes a little bit from here, a little bit from there, a little bit from there, to create something new. So that opened something to me because I was really feeling like I was creating something new by mixing things from different uh, areas. And you cannot create the collage on a direct path. You <coughs> must go on that playful road and collect stuff until you really create something that is unique to you. <coughs> so. I started making collages and I realized that this sort of communication really suited me. I felt very comfortable doing it and I've been doing it for the last 20 years. Now, when I create a collage, the chances of arriving to the right solution at the beginning are pretty much zero. I need to find like a hundred objects in order to find the one object that I need. For example, using, making the eyes of Einstein, I had the idea to use gears, but go and find the exact gears. I think I went through like 19 gears until pair of gears number 20 was the right one that really gave the feeling of an old man's eyes. So this is simple trial and error. And because I'm playing, I'm allowing myself to make mistakes. I don't get depressed because I'm playing. Playfulness allows you to do that. 
Sports is a good example. Soccer players, most of the time, they don't score goals. But you don't see soccer players going around the court depressed, full of self-doubt, you know, because they're playing. And they accept those little failures because they know that in the next uh, attack, they might have another chance of scoring. <coughs> another thing that comes back again and again is the happy accidents. When I was making the portrait <laughs> of Homer Simpson, I uh, didn't have a good idea. I kept throwing my sketches to the garbage can until I saw that the garbage can in my studio looked exactly like the mouth of Homer Simpson. <laughs> so playfulness allows you to be at the present. And when you're at the present, you're more aware of what's going on. And you, because you're not guided by preconceptions, you're there. And then is when you start seeing what the world brings to you. Another thing that happens to me when I make portraits is that it's, again, it's connected to the previous point. It's easy to forget the preconceptions. I was making this portrait and I realized that I didn't need a face to convey Fidel Castro. Once I realized that, I really started to go crazy with materials using a stretch rubber balloon for Michael Jackson, because it's obviously that that's what his skin was made of. <laughs> or sausage for Yeltsin. Or bread for Karl Marx. A drumstick for Golda Meir. I actually bought those Golda Meir shoes, Golda shoes, um, in the orthopedic store that used to sell her <laughs> shoes in King George Street in Tel Aviv. Even a filter fish for Tommy Lapid. But perhaps the biggest thing I learned making collages with objects is about flexibility, about having the capacity to adapt. Because you're making something and uh, while the objects are not glued, you can move them around all the time. So there is a lot of flexibility. And, um, and at a certain point I realized that I wasn't only working in that way, I was starting to live my life in that way, in that flexible way. And it happened to me first when I made, when I wrote and illustrated my first children's book over 12 years ago, Notsaz Gula in Hebrew, or The Perfect Purple Feather in English. The book became quite successful here in Israel. It was a bestseller. And then kids started sending me pictures <laughs> that they made with food or with objects. <laughs> very, very innocent pictures. And some of them were less innocent. For example, Lior Zamir, she sent me a picture of Monica Lewinsky. Limor was 12, Lior was 12 at the time. And she attached a letter and said, and also put the stain. <laughs> People in Israel develop very fast, you know. <laughs> That's my little asbarata moment. <laughs> um, so, um, I'm happy to report that Lior is 25 now, and she's, a one, she's getting married next month, and she's a <laughs> wonderful, smart, and funny lady. Um, but that brought me to start doing workshops. First visiting little kindergartens and kids in schools and do workshops. And then I started to work with kids in other countries, like for example in Brazil, or in China, actually working with the Minister, Ministry of Foreign Relations of Israel, with Misrad Achutz. And slowly I also realized that the participants in my workshops were growing and were becoming older. And I realized that adults were having as much fun and were creating with as much ease. Look at this self-portrait that this guy made. And he's no artist, he's an x-ray technician in a hospital. So, Playing with objects was giving people the possibility to go around their limitations, their self-perceived technical limitations in drawing. Perhaps if I were to give them a pencil and a white piece of paper, they would have done something like that. No, I don't know how to draw. 
But because they were playing, they could go around those difficulties. And uh, it was sort of the same process that I went through 20 years earlier. And um, I have one more little story of another gift that I found, another treasure. I was contacted by a group of art therapists to come and work with children in an oncological <coughs> department uh, in Schneider Hospital in Tel Aviv. And we made uh, three days of workshops with the kids. So for example, a kid that went through a um, bone marrow transplant, he made a portrait of the doctor that performed the procedure on him using the same syringe that the doctor used for the nose. Um, and then we went on to work with adult cancer patients. And then we were called to work with Israeli soldiers suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder. And you should have seen those 50 and 60 year old Israeli men playing for hours with objects and uh, really making amazing communicative pieces. Like look at this self-portrait. Who is the person, the small fish or the big fish? So I realized that it wasn't really about creating art. Playfulness through the use of collage allowed people to tell their stories in a non-verbal way, in a visual way, which is something that telling a story is something that all of us want to do. So I want to end with this picture of this guy. He's a kid that participated in a workshop in Bialik Rogozin School in, in Tel Aviv. And uh, supposedly the kid didn't get it. You know, you're not supposed to glue it on yourself. You're supposed to glue it on the, on the, wall, on the board that you're working. But because he was playing, he was listening only to his heart, to his belly, to whatever, to his own inner voice. He wasn't listening to me. He wasn't listening to the constraints of the external wall. And because he was doing that, he was free and he was able to create a memorable image that perhaps he wouldn't be able to create other ways. Because when we play, we are free. Thank you very much. Thank you.